Imperial Japan, being a country with an extensive coastline and a powerful navy, had a number of very interesting hydroplane designs, mainly from Kawanishi, who served as the primary designers of the most famous Japanese flying boats throughout the Second World War, such as the H-8K and the H-6K series. However, in the years leading up to the Second World War, Aichi Kokuki was also a serious player in the hydroplane market, and today's episode is about their most successful design, the E-13A. In 1937, the Imperial Japanese Navy issued a specification, 12 Shi, to replace the obsolescent Kawanishi E-7K-2, a reconnaissance floatplane originally developed back in March 1932 though, despite its antiquated design, would still stay in frontline service during the Pacific War until 1943. The E-7K2 was, by all accounts, a reliable and capable reconnaissance platform, and was ahead of its time when it first took to the skies in 1933, but the IJN, in the interest of retaining their position as one of the most powerful navies on the planet, would continue their push for modernization. 12 Shi specified a single-engined hydroplane suitable for a ship-launched catapult system, and Aichi, Kawanishi, and Nakajima were all requested to put forward design proposals by the Navy. Kawanishi and Nakajima were the more experienced firms for an aircraft of this role, and so Aichi sort of went in as the underdog. All three companies would comply and begin development in the following months. Kawanishi's design, the E-12K, was drawn up but did not progress beyond the prototype stage and was later struck from the competition. Both Aichi and Nakajima, with their E-12A and E-12N respectively, were deemed to have aircraft worthy of evaluation, and further development was conducted into both designs. That same year, the Navy would issue a second specification, this time for a three-seater reconnaissance seaplane, and in response to this, Kawanishi produced prototypes of their E-13K design, whilst Aichi decided to modify their E-12A, dubbing it the E-13A, to meet the new standard rather than spend more time and effort designing a wholly new aircraft. The design that would become the E-13A featured an all-metal construction, though the ailerons, elevator and rudder were still fabric covered. The standard production variant would be very lightly armed, even for an aircraft of its role and time, housing only a single rear-facing 7.7mm Type 92 machine gun. This would be somewhat remedied later on by fitting a downward-firing 20mm cannon, though by this time this armament would also be lacklustre. The Aichi had a wingspan of 14.5 metres, and a length and height of 11.3 and 7.3 metres respectively. Empty, the aircraft weighed in at around 2,642 kilograms, and could carry a further 1,000 kilograms fully loaded. The aircraft was to be launched from an IGN ship via a catapult system, and would be recovered by landing next to the ship and then lifted back up by a crane. For this role, the IG featured folding wings, which vastly reduced the required hangar space on the ship. In October 1938, both aircraft companies conducted the first test flights of their respective designs, under supervision of officials, who would universally deem Aichi's design to be the better of the two. Though it was heavier than the Kawanishi, this was offset by its substantially beefier power plant, the powerful 1080 horsepower Mitsubishi Kensi 43, which was a 14-cylinder radial engine. The Kawanishi actually displayed better performance than the Aichi, with the exception of top speed, though reportedly it was harder to fly and thus required a more skilled pilot to handle, leading to the ultimate selection of the Aichi instead. In light of these trials, the three-seater variant of the aircraft was also chosen to be of primary importance, and development of the earlier E-12A and E-12N was cancelled. 1940 saw further testing of the E-13A seaplane, which was finally chosen as the winner of the contest and ordered into production in December of 1940, by which time it was already bordering on obsolescence. Despite this, the E-13A, perhaps unusually for an aircraft of this era, saw very little in terms of modifications or variants throughout the Pacific War, remaining virtually unchanged throughout its entire production run from 1940 through to 1944. That being said, some small changes were made. 
Some of these changes included a trainer version fitted with dual controls for a trainee and an instructor, dubbed the E13A1-K. A version fitted with air-to-service radar was known as the E13A1B, and a version equipped to strafe and to destroy lightly armoured vessels, which fitted dual belly-mounted downward firing 20mm cannons, was known as the E13A1C. Later on in 1944, some permanent changes were introduced to the aircraft coming off the production line, which were not retrofitted to existing models. The E-13A1 appeared early in the year and featured stronger bracing with extra struts for the pontoons. It also had dampers for the exhaust flames to reduce visibility on night operations, and a flexible Type 99 20mm cannon in the rear ventral position that fired downwards, operated by the observer. Though it could be used for defence, this was mostly intended for strafing American patrol boats. The A-13A1A had all the same modifications as its predecessor, whilst also carrying more radio equipment for use over longer ranges. Both featured a streamlined propeller spinner, which was lacking on their predecessors, and all versions came with four underwing shackles, capable of holding up to 250 kilograms of bombs, though lighter loads were more commonly used by the type, generally 60 kilogram bombs or depth charges. In classic Japanese fashion, all variants lacked crew armour or self-sealing fuel tanks, an omission which would render the aircraft increasingly vulnerable as the war in the Pacific progressed. The only defensive capabilities were provided by the Observer facing rearward, who originally operated a single 7.7mm machine gun, though by late in the war this must have been of questionable utility against the powerful American fighters. And of course, for some models, the ventral 20mm cannon could somewhat be used for defence as well. Aichi produced only 133 E-13As between 1940 and 1942, before production was ramped up by Kyushu Hikoki KK, which produced 1,237 between 1942 and the end of the war. A further 48 were also produced by the 11th Naval Air Arsenal at Hiro, but their main focus was on larger flying boats. The aircraft entered service with reconnaissance units in 1941, and saw its combat debut during the Second Sino-Japanese War, taking part in a bombing raid on a Chinese railway. During this conflict, the E-13A operated from seaplane tenders and cruisers, giving a 1000 km circular range of visibility to the ship it was launched from. As part of the 8th Cruiser Division, it would also serve as the aircraft responsible for the pre-raid reconnaissance for the infamous attack on Pearl Harbor. Following this, the US would encounter the Little Aichi, which was designated Jake as an Allied call sign, in ever larger numbers as the war progressed, the aircraft playing a significant role in the battles of the Coral Sea and Midway. As production numbers increased, the aircraft would become a common sight in many Japanese naval operations, and it would see service in coastal patrols, ground attacks, troop support, sea rescue operations, and later in the war, perhaps somewhat predictably, kamikaze attacks on US shipping as well. It also featured in the East Asia Naval Special Service, stationed out of Penang. This was made up of a single Aichi E-13A, serving alongside two Luftwaffe Arado AR-96s, painted in Japanese markings. This unlikely trio assisted the ill-fated German Monsoon Group, as well as Japanese naval operations in that area. By mid-1943, over 250 E-13As were in active service on board Japanese ships in the Pacific, though by this time their utility was severely hampered if marauding American fighters happened to be operating in the area. As the war progressed and the IJN's fortunes went from good to bad to comically horrific, the unfortunate Japanese float plane would be thrust into a number of roles it had never been designed for, including intercepting B-29s, and I wish I was joking. One fascinating incident comes from the 5th of May 1945, 
where an A6M2N0, which was a zero in float configuration, and an Aichi E13A were patrolling the Bungo Suido Strait area in the southwest seas of Japan, where they came across an American submarine with a supporting Dumbo B-29, which was used for air-sea rescue operations. The submarine immediately dove and reported the two aircraft to the B-29, which, somewhat hilariously, dove in and began engaging the Japanese aircraft, acting as a flying gunship. The A6M2, perhaps rather wisely upon seeing the flying behemoth bear down upon it, peeled off and returned to base, but the E-13A attempted bravely and foolishly to fight the B-29 alone. At this point, the American submarine had resurfaced, and its crew watched the engagement with interest from just three kilometers away, whilst the E-13 and the B-29 engaged in what was essentially a dogfight. Unfortunately, but predictably, David did not triumph over Goliath. Eventually, the E-13A was hit fatally by the B-29's numerous defensive gun turrets, and went down in flames at 10.06 in the morning, courtesy of no armor and no self-sealing fuel tanks. Eleven minutes later, the submarine arrived at the scene of the crash and discovered the three Japanese airmen. Two of them had been killed, though the observer had survived, albeit badly wounded and screaming for help. He was lifted on board and treated for his wounds, eventually returning to Japan in 1946, where they kept in touch with the medic who had treated them aboard the submarine. He was lifted on board and treated for his wounds, eventually returning to Japan in 1946, where he kept in touch with the medic who had treated him. This matchup displays the unfortunate circumstances in which many Japanese airmen would find themselves, in an obsolete aircraft with minimal training, sent up against universally and numerically superior aircraft and crews. Its eventual demise at the hands of fighters and air raids did not represent the capability of the aircraft itself. In its intended role, the E-13A was stable, fast, and displayed good handling in the air and on the water. The glazed canopy provided great visibility, and a maximum 15-hour flight endurance was impressive for a single-engine aircraft developed in the late 1930s. The Aichi E-13A would not, however, conclude its service life in the hands of the Japanese. Eight examples would be captured by the Aeronaval, the French Naval Air Force, after the Imperial Japanese Army evacuated the French colony of Indochina, leaving a great deal of equipment behind, among which were some Aichi float planes. These would be painted in French livery and used from 1945 to 1947 by the Aeronaval's 8S Squadron during the First Indochina War, being officially decommissioned in August 1948. They operated mainly from BAN Cat Lai, close to Saigon, which happened to also be the same base that they had operated from under Japanese control in the preceding years. Thailand would also operate a number of the E-13As until 1948, which was the final year of the aircraft's service. This service amounted to seven years of near-constant use, though never particularly glorious or glamorous, and the lack of surviving examples is one of the reasons this aircraft has fallen into obscurity. A number of known submerged wrecks of the aircraft are scattered around the Southeast Asian and Pacific waters, but unfortunately no complete examples are known to survive today. The salvaged wreck of one aircraft was temporarily on display at the Kakamigahara Air Force Base in Japan, and it's a possible contender for restoration. Hopefully it does get restored, for the little Aichi design takes the crown as the most produced Japanese float plane of the war, with a total production run of 1418 being built. Its production run and service life puts it on par with Allied aircraft, such as the Kingfisher, and yet it receives very little coverage, so hopefully today's video did a little to correct that. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the patrons. We're in December now, which means Christmas is just around the corner. If my plans actually work out, there should be zero interruption to the upload schedule. I'm trying to get a bit of a backlog going at the moment, but we'll see how that pans out. 
Also, apologies if the narration for this video is a bit funky. I'm just feeling a little bit under the weather at the moment, so I had to do a couple of takes to get this right, but hopefully it's all good. And a big shout out, of course, to the Wing Commander patrons, the highest tier members of this special group. Now, I'm debating having some sort of coffee mug or something made for the officer tier members. Nothing's confirmed yet, but keep an eye out over on Patreon for updates on that particular matter. But thank you all so much for your continued support, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.